These are the nine qualities of a good nurse to be that nurse, to be, I feel like, respected in the healthcare profession where you won't be a lone wolf. People reach out to you. You're going to be a great advocate. Patients will love you. Your culture, your nurses, your doctors will love you. And I think if you could hone in on these nine qualities or see where you lack, where you can improve, it'll make you an overall a better healthcare professional. Oh, I got to go. I've been working, told them, please don't hit my phone. I'm in my zone, bro. Just leave me alone. Was on the road, but I swear I'm coming home. Now the drinks on me, I think we need a toast. See, I did it for me. Now my old friends calling, told them nothing's for free. Told me time is money, dog. I swear I paid on my fees. I was starving for this day. Now my fan, they can't eat. Hey everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome to the Cup of Nurses show here with your hosts, Peter and Matt, two nurses on a mission to change this world, one conversation at a time. Thank you for tuning in. If you want to join us on this mission, please share and review the show. It would mean absolutely everything to us. Cupofnurses.com for the latest info, merch releases, and we also have a resource page full of freebies on there. So check that out. For a lifestyle podcast, you can check out weareflyingwarriors.com. On this episode, we like to talk about the nine unique qualities of making a good nurse. Being a nurse is required for you to have a certain skill set and certain qualities for you to excel in your career and excel in patient care. And if you want to be one of those nurses that people look up to and you want to have good qualities, you got to get these nine qualities or most of them on the list. And it starts with being a team player, having hard work ethic, learning to communicate with everybody on the healthcare team, being flexible, going with the flow of what's happening. Don't be hyper independent and not help others. Learning to have empathy and compassion, having emo emotional stability, stability, not to be tempered, paying attention to detail, having problem solving skills to be a critical thinker and being a patient advocate. So the first on the list, one of the most important ones is being a team player. If you're trying to be a nurse and just do everything by yourself, do it solo, it's not going to work out very long. It might work out for one shift, maybe two shifts, but there is going to be a time early on in your in your week where you're gonna need somebody to help. You can need somebody to help you boost somebody, you can need to ask somebody a question because you don't know all the answers. It's a very team-driven approach. You have physicians there, you have respiratory therapists, you have CNAs, you all, you all have to work together as a team to just provide the best patient care and the best patient experience you, you can give. And if you're just trying to do everything solo, well, guess what, you're already overwhelmed and now you're overwhelming yourself even more. And being a team player sometimes will mean where you're having a busy shift and you don't have break nurses like in California where you have to go be a lunch buddy or a nurse buddy, break buddy, I forgot what they call them out here, to take your uh, coworkers two patients or four patients while they go on break and it's going to make you a busier shift. But can you be that where you can then go on getting a 15 minute break and have that, you know, juggle throughout the night uh, shift? So... It's very important to be a team player because people look out for you. So to develop this quality skill, you don't always have to just be asked to be a team player first. Like go out your way when maybe you have some downtime and go round on your nurses, just like the charge nurse rounds on her nurses to make sure everything's okay. You could round on your coworkers and see if they need help. Even if it's nothing, they'll. it's also just feels good when you know that another coworker has your back in general, regardless if they're helping you or not. Yeah, you have to, you have to be a team player. It's a unit. It's, it's your home. It's your environment. Everyone's got to work together. The second most important one is going to be learn to communicate with everybody. Majority of your job as a nurse, you're speaking, you're talking, you're communicating to your patient. I want to say like 70 to 80% of the shift. Sometimes you do more talking with one patient than you, than you do actual physical, physical care or, or other patient care. So that's, it's very important because if you don't know how to tell your patient what you're going to do or tell the patient the plan or the family the plan or even pick up the phone and update the, the family on, on the patient status, you're going to have a really big, big struggle because majority of the time we're communicating. And that's just from the patient's perspective. Now, now look at who else you have to communicate with. You have to communicate with the doctor. If you don't know how to communicate with the doctor, you're not going to get the orders, orders you want. You're not going to understand the treatment. You're not going to understand what's going on. If you don't know how to communicate with a respiratory therapist, you're not going to know what's going on from their standpoint. You're not going to know how to ask for ask for help as well. If you don't know how to communicate with the tech, 
that's an issue too, because what if you need help with a bed bath or help changing a patient? Communication is, is a vital part of, of being a nurse. Yeah, and when it comes to quality care of the patient, working with the interdisciplinary team and everybody in healthcare is going to help do that. Especially as a nurse, you know that you are a middleman when it comes to figuring things out with the patient. Sometimes when you're in higher acute care, uh, acute care situations, for example, in the ICU, you're going to have a cardiologist comes in that wants to do X, Y, and Z, for example, maybe diuresis the patient. And they're not communicating with renal to see if we if it's okay to diuresis, how are the kidneys looking from the standpoint, creatinine is a little bit high, will the nephrologist allow that to happen? Well, you're going to be the middleman where has to, you have to call a nephro and maybe bounce back a couple times and talk to cardiology. I know in some teaching hospitals, that's more of a smoother process. In smaller hospitals that I've worked in the past, you're going to be dealing with things where going back and forth, and that's where communication is going to be a high-quality skill for you to have to just be an awesome nurse. The third good quality of a nurse is flexibility in your shift. We all go into work with this playbook of what you want done when. Maybe I like to assess my patient, then look at meds, then look at labs, but that has to be flexible because... Your shift rarely goes the way you intended, intended to go and the way you predicted. You have to always be be able to, to change up what you're doing just because it's just a lot of the stuff in the hospital is very acute. And if you can't respond quickly to emergencies or patient changes, you're going to definitely struggle and you're going to be very stressed out and you're going to get burned out very easily. You have to be able to adapt to the situation. Maybe I shouldn't give the first patient's meds. Maybe I should go assess patient number two first because he's complaining of maybe shortness of breath. Just because I want to give this first patient the meds and assess him because he's like the easiest or I want to get it out of the way. That's not what I should be doing. I should be flexible and I understand that, hey, there's, there's a greater priority here and I have to first entertain that priority because if I don't go to that priority, that's going to turn into a bigger problem or it's going to turn into a problem because right now it's not a problem, it's a priority. But if this priority turns turn into a problem, Guess what? That makes your shift a whole lot worse and you're going to have to get other people involved. And it just, a, you just don't want to, to have things escalate when you had the chance or the time to intervene with them. Agreed. And also this flexibility comes down to your shift. Just like you said, if, if in a perfect situation I see, I love to do a bed bath on my intubated patient, one of them or both of them by 11 o'clock, I could go maybe break by midnight and it's a smoother shift after 1 a.m. if I'm working night shift. But that doesn't always go as planned or able to be flexible and adapt to situations. Even if I have this idea of when I want to do things on my unit, what if I float? Am I still flexible being a float nurse, being outside of my specialty and still doing things? We've done that plenty of times where every single shift was just like a form of unknown anxiety. It's like, mm. let's just jump in here and go with the flow. Can you go with the flow? And maybe you're upset that you have to float or work a different unit. Can you still not be a negative Nancy per se and still go down to the unit that you're going to work and still give 100% of your effort with that team down there? It's a different culture, different unit. I, I know cattiness and drama exists, whatever, in some workplaces. But can you put all that aside and still be an awesome, high-quality nurse where they'll respect you and you could still help them and, and do all the qualities that we were talking about on the show? And then also flexibility comes down to sometimes working weekends and giving that up for yourself. I know being a staff nurse, we had to work every other weekend. Being 22 years old and working every other weekend sucked because everybody was out partying while you had to go work Saturday night. Can you, can you put that aside for yourself to be a nurse? Because that's what your profession requires, especially working in the hospital setting. Yeah, that's all really good points. And flexibility is really important when you're a travel nurse or you're a flow nurse because you just constantly are thrown around in different places, different environments, and you have to be able to adapt and change. You can kind of get away with being a little inflexible when you're when you're a staff nurse and have been working the same unit for, for years and years and years. You just get into this like this this flow and you kind of already know what's going on, what, what to expect. Then you could kind of push back on flexibility a little bit because you're already so used to that unit and you're already so accustomed to the problems that go down and the issues that, that arise where you could kind of handle being a little bit more stubborn on having everything be, be scheduled and punctual. Number four, a tip of high quality nurse is don't be hyper independent and not help others. 
So this is a double-edged sword where you become too used to your skill set, the specialty day at work, and you just want to do your own thing, get things done so you can be back on your phone scrolling or sitting down and not helping out your colleagues. So this kind of falls into being a team player and giving a helping hand. I know as a travel nurse, this becomes more of a quality that you need to maximize, I would say, yeah, because you're used to being a lone wolf. Mm-hmm. You're not used, you're not, you don't know anybody in the hospital sometimes. You just want to do your own thing, get in, get out, get the paycheck. Sounds a little bit selfish, but as a travel nurse, you're, you're locked on the money, you're trying to pay off debt, whatever it is. So even though you're really good at what you're doing, you're the Navy SEAL, you jump in, you knock things out, like still be that team player that we talked about in the first quality where you're going to ask your coworkers and see how they're doing because staff nurses like travel nurses like that they go help out or in general nurses that are just team players so don't be somebody that just does things on their own own and it's also a double-edged sword because then if you are that lone wolf nurse cool you're getting things done people don't know about you it might make your shift go slower. And then if you need help and struggling, maybe those nurses won't be as susceptible to helping you out because of the way you work and operate on the shift. A good way to look at it is like karma. The more you help people, the more likely they're going to help you. And you mentioned travel nursing. This is like a, like a big thing because this is like your key to to entering the the unit or entering the the click or, or entering entering the the point in nursing where you're not just a travel nurse, you're actually part of the unit is by helping people. It opens up communication. It opens up room for dialogue. It it shows that you're a team player. Being able to take time out of your shift and out of your day to help others, that's a really good trait to have, not just at bedside, but anywhere in life. You want to be able to help people because even though you might not have needed help this last month, but guess what? You might need help on your next shift. And no one's going to want to help you if if you just sat alone by yourself and on downtime decided to do your own thing, look on your phone or do read books or something instead of helping out. Because you're going to have a time where you're going to need help. And the best way for to have somebody help you is by first helping them. No lie. I'm very hyper independent on doing my own turns. Hmm. I just sometimes get annoyed asking for help. I'm a bigger guy, way 185, whatever, I'll just use one hand to turn the patient, tuck a pillow. I become hyper independent there unless it's like late, you know, late night, my back's hurting a little bit. I'll mingle where I'll ask somebody to help me so we could create small talk, whatever, and I could help them and we'll have like a quick 10 minute uh, process where we just turn patients, whatever. But usually I like to be hyper independent, especially in the ICU. There's people always running around who has time for a turn sometimes. You don't have the overhead lift. Mm. What you going to do? <laughs> yeah, I mean, 100%. That's one of the benefits of being a dude is that you're, you're stronger and you could just turn these patients by yourself instead of being like a five foot four, 100 pound Filipino nurse that, you know, doesn't have the strength to to turn a patient. So that's where injuries happen. But if I'm trying to be, be, be efficient, I'll just do it myself. Am I risking it myself for injury? Yeah, but in, in theory, yeah. But in reality, not really. Patient isn't too heavy. I could just do it myself. I'm in here already. Let me just get it out of the way. Yes, 100%. Tip number five of a high quality nurse is having empathy and be compassionate. Everything comes down to patient care and you want to ensure that the patient feels safe, trusted, understood. They're going through one of their most difficult times in healthcare. Can you be there for them? And a lot of times the problems and the situations, the fears that patients have, have nothing to do with their procedures sometimes. They're worried about finances, bills, who's going to feed their cat, who's going to feed their dog, the neighbors, watering their plants. Who knows? There's so many different fears and situations and problems that patients bring up. How can you know them? Maybe it's not the GI procedure that they're going with or the NG insertion. You have to sit down and talk to them and communicate to see what's exactly going on in their head. Because if they feel valued and understood, it's going to make a positive shift for you, for them, and it's going to ultimately impact their recovery. Uh, one situation I could think of right now is like before a contract ended, I had a Spanish, uh, Spanish-speaking Spanish patient that nobody really wanted to use an interpreter to get things done, right? Mm-hmm. Because it was an inconvenience of time. When I came into the shift, she just felt very flustered. She didn't feel understood because I just felt it by her. Whatever, I'm like, I'm going to prioritize this patient, put on an interpreter, talk to her for a little bit. And within those 15 minutes, 
she felt understood and heard. I asked her about pain, gave her some thing, uh, pain pills, and she ended up sleeping better. And she was one of my best patients. But from the beginning of my shift, I'm like, all right, this is going to be a disaster because she doesn't speak English and it's just going to be one of those rough shifts. But it turned out to be good. It just, she didn't feel understood. Simple as that. Communicate, create empathy, be a compassionate nurse, and it's going to go a long way, which could even improve your shift if you're being, you know, thinking about that. But ultimately, it's going to help patients recover and everything else. Maybe they share some cool stories and it's going to be a good shift. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I could recommend for this if you want to be a little bit more empathetic, is just ask open-ended questions. Don't just ask, are you in pain? That's a yes or no question. Ask them how they feel. How do you feel about your procedure today? How have you been feeling in a hospital? You've been here for, for three nights, three days. How, how have you been feeling? Just that, that simple question is how do you feel? Not, not yes or no questions. Not do you have any pain? Does this hurt? Can you do this? Can you do that? Just generally ask them how, you, how they feel. How's their family doing? Just get to know them a little bit. I know you might not have time to ask a bunch of questions or really get down into the nitty gritty details, but you really don't have to. You just have to ask simple questions of how they feel, how certain things are making them feel. Do they have any any concerns with whatever is going down tomorrow? Has the doctor explained to you everything? Can I answer any questions for you? Do you have any questions for me? Little, little things like that go a long way that even though they might not open up to you right away, but the fact that you asked that question, maybe he might, he or she might not give you a, a, the response that you want, but maybe you might come back and they might be like, you know, you asked me a little bit ago about, about how I feel. I know I told you this, but really this is how I feel. And you're like, okay, damn. Even though that question didn't, didn't open him up, but just him thinking about that and you just asking it just, just out, of, out of you caring, that just makes them feel a whole lot better and feel, makes them feel more as a human, not just something you're taking care of, not like a, not like a, not like a sick animal makes them feel like a real human being. Yeah, I think that's something that patients struggle with. You bring up a good point, man, because we're just so in and out. We're so task focused where we leave that important touch with our patients. And they, and they do feel like that. Some of them express it. The nurses don't even care. Hmm. I recently had a family member in the hospital. And they're like, it took 30 minutes for a call to close the door, whatever it might be. And again, I know nurses that are listening out there, it's like, yeah, our job is stressful. Hospitals don't provide the right environments for us. We, we, we went into healthcare to help patients and that quickly got washed down of the reality of the business of hospitals. So just do your best to be there for your patients mm. till we create this uh, nursing revolution and figure, figure better work environments for all of us and let's unite in the near future. But yeah, quality number six, having emotional stability and being tempered. As a nurse, you know that your situation, your shift might change in any given moment, you're going to be under pressure. There's going to be a lot of emotional turmoil happening. Can you remain stable? Can you remain calm? Can you still be able to think critically through the situation while you have a lot of emotional uh, instability? Or it might be a patient that just passed away and the family's, family's going through a lot. You've been with the patient for a couple of shifts, three shifts, maybe for the past two weeks and things just didn't go well. Can you remain calm? Can you compartmentalize your emotions for the right moment for you to have your groovy moment? Can you be there in silence for your patient? There's so much that goes into emotions during a shift or it could be with coworkers. It could be with doctors, especially as a night shift nurse. You call a, pay, a doctor and he makes it seem like it's an inconvenience to him. Why the hell are you calling me? Mm -hmm. And it feels sometimes shitty as a nurse. There's new grad nurses that have cried over the situation. Can you create some emotional stability so you could provide the best quality care and maybe have that poker face? Because I understand that your emotions are valid and it sucks, but it sucks even more for your patients. So can you put that aside for a little bit till you do what's best for the patient and maybe sit in your chair and afterwards and decompartmentalize and just validate your emotions and feel better. Uh, definitely a hard thing. And Peter and I could both contest that there's so many nurses that even like leave their baggage or that take their baggage home with them, right? Mm. And feel overwhelmed from healthcare in general because they don't know how to just leave their work behind. So a lot goes into emotions when it comes to healthcare because who the hell as a profession has to deal with what we deal with, especially death and dying. Yeah, yeah. This for this one, the emotions. This is sometimes you just gotta fake it to make it. 
sometimes you could be so scared on the inside, you might not have any idea what what to do, how to react. But like Matt said, you gotta keep that poker face. Like the patient is in distress, he's in a life or death situation, you're not. You just gotta be able to figure out how to just put that mask on and just be cool, act cool. And this is even with patients that are like CWAP protocols, alcohol draw patients, or patients that have psych issues that are really getting you angry because they, because they're just stubborn and they don't want to do something just because you're asking them to do it. That's when you really have to just put your feelings aside because there's been times where I was super angry at a patient during a shift. I'm like, whatever, you know, let me just get through this day. It's frustrating because patients, they're, they're humans. They know how to how to make you frustrated. They know how to, to really make, make you tick, but it's like, you just gotta calm down be like, you know, it's whatever. They're, they're upset they're at the hospital. I'm upset at them because they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing that I know is going to make them better, but it's whatever. Like they're in the hospital, at least I get to go home and it's like, put that frustration aside. It's super hard, it's very hard to do, but it's something you have to learn how to do, especially with those patients that are, that are just not listening and, and, and don't care about their own health or don't care about being helped. Because then you're like, why are you here if you don't want any kind of a help, but you got to put that aside because you can't say that you can't say it to a patient. You can't be like, you know, if you don't want to adhere to these, to these protocols, why are you here? You can't say that to a patient. You just have to just close your mouth and just be like, okay, I'll see you later. If you need anything, let me know and just go about your day. And that's probably one of the hardest th things to learn that and dealing with the, with the sadness and, uh, and the emotions that come with a patient deteriorating or something going down. But that it kind of comes with experience because the more you see something, the more relaxed you are about the situation, like code situations. Like we could attest that we were for sure as new grads, we always freaked out when we had a code we're like, oh shit, what do I do? What do I do now? It's like, it, we still freak out a little bit, but it's not as big of a, big of a deal because it's engraved in us on what we should do. And our biggest fear is not only what to do, not necessarily about what's going on, but, but the fact that we don't know what to do. And yeah. once you learn how to do certain things, that goes away and you feel more confident, your emotions are are put on the sideline and you're able to actually think through things and actually do what you're supposed to do. Yes. And a last little tip about this emotional stability is find a coworker or maybe a spouse or somebody in your immediate family, whoever coworker, that could provide some emotional stability for you if you feel frustrated that there's something going on. I haven't really done this much. I don't know if it's because I'm a male, maybe females have different situations where we don't maybe vent per se to our coworkers about situations. Mm -hmm. We just kind of like go with it. Maybe you and I sometimes post shift, we talk about things or to whoever, but for the most part, yeah, find somebody they could relate to somewhat. Maybe even if it's not a medical situation, just have them hear you out so you could put your emotions together and feel better about the situation or whatever happened. Yeah, I feel like as you get better as a nurse and you, have, you put those years in, you have a better work-life balance where you could just kind of forget that kind of stuff. You could just, whatever happened at work, okay, happened at work, now we're moving on. That's not gonna gonna carry carry with me. But yeah, it might, might be a thing because we're dudes, we're not, we're not as emotionally drawn to things, but you know, to each their own. It's a great question for a future female guest when we think about this, is like how do you deal with emotions in the workplace mm -hmm. and to what degree do they affect you? Because at the end of the day, we have different biochemistry between a different sex. Yeah, it's okay. It's cool. Uh, the seventh good quality of a nurse is going to be attention to detail. This could be something small or even something big like the, the Rhonda case. Look at that. The, the nurse pulled the wrong medication, patient ended up dying. You always got to gotta know what you're doing, why you're doing it, and, and double check because something as simple as you might think where it comes to pulling medications out of Pixis can now turn into a life or death situation. Even looking at your patient's urine, it, it's going from, from yellow straw color to now it's like a more of an orangey. What's going on? Patient's being, being dehydrated. Maybe you need some more fluids. Like little things like that, that, that might not seem important in the moment, but could be important later on. Or if they're addressed sooner, they're going to not lead to, to problems developing. Good points. This and this attention to detail could be just like you said, when you're administering medications, you're double checking things, maybe double checking your lines, tubes, and drains. In the ICU, we're gonna be double checking 
medications that are running to making sure maybe the volume is added correctly. Because if the volume is not added correctly and the tubing runs dry, damn, is that annoying, mm. especially if it's a pressure, what's going to happen then? Sometimes even in the ICU, things get missed where maybe it's the wrong kilograms of the patient. They're getting a different weight. Is that being looked at? So you could be a, you, you could have attention to detail there. You could also have attention to detail assessing your patient. Maybe another nurse missed something and the sepsis is getting worse or the patient is still getting unstable. Another nurse misses it. Are you going to be that nurse that's going to catch mistakes and correct? I know a handful of times we're talking about our travel contracts when we notice something or what about that patient? Um, and I don't, it was more on a debrief where we knew his ABG was bad on COPD. He probably needed to be intubated, but it was postponed. Mm -hmm. Then what happened? Patient coded because things could have been prevented with better airway management, better respiratory function. Should have been done three days ago, right? So just attention to detail and just trusting your gut sometimes when you know what could be the most beneficial for the patient. And then carrying that out, talking to somebody in the team about it. And this is going to go more for... Uh, tip number nine, if you find something that you notice when you're paying attention to detail, can you advocate for your patient mm. so he gets the best quality care? Mm. Also, your eyes and nose. Eyes and nose are important. I know sometimes people slack on eyes and nose, but in the ICU, eyes and nose are very important. They're a really big dictator on the fluid status of your patient. Sometimes nurses forget that. Same with weights. But to be honest, I prefer to have eyes and nose spot on versus a weight because some nurses weigh a patient with pillows on. Some nurses don't. Is there it's was there four? Tell. Yeah, is there four pillows on last time? Two pillows. What's the what's the weight gain coming from? Is it actual real weight gain versus like if you have really accurate eyes and nose, then you know how much is going in and how much is going out. Uh, the eighth quality of a good nurse is going to be problem solving skills. So when you call a physician, the best thing you could do is present the problem, what's going on, and also offer a solution already ahead of time. And this is going to definitely come with, with years of experience as a nurse. It's going to be hard to do this as a new grad. But still, don't just always ask for a solution. Try to figure out what's going on. If, for example, your patient has high blood pressure, try to be thinking, why is he have high blood pressure? Is he nervous? Is, is he in pain? Is he, is he stressed? Is he moving around in a bed? Like what's going on? What's going on with that patient that's reading this high blood pressure? Because it might not necessarily be, be a heart attack. It might just be the cuff is on too tight or, or the cuff is too small. And you're, ca you're calling a physician for, for blood pressure medications that are not appropriate because all you had to do was just adjust the cuff and it shows that it's normal. Now you gave him antihypertensives and now the blood pressure is low. You went from being real high to being re real low without any really underlying issue besides the cuff having to be fixed. And I think to be a great problem solver and have this skill and be a critical thinker, you need to have quality assessments and you do need to know have you need to know how to have some knowledge. So I think it first comes down to getting a good report. Not everybody gives a good report. So what do you do afterwards? You look into your notes to find out the most crucial things. Get a decent set of vitals. If you're doing vitals on your own, you don't have CNAs to figure out what the baseline is. You do a good, thorough baseline assessment. You know, you know your status of your patient. You know if he deteriorates, something changes, his LOC changes, maybe his respirations increases, he gets ronchi, whatever it is, you're there noticing these little details. You're paying attention to details, so then you could be a problem solver. These, qu these qualities are merging together because you need one with the other. And not every single situation, you're going to know what to do, just like Pete said. What can you do? Can you ask a coworker and not feel like you, you're a know-it-all to ask questions to maybe be a problem solver, ask for second opinion? And then if you don't know things, can you escalate it to the chain of command? Maybe it's going to be somebody from a different team like RT or PT. Can you escalate it to your charge nurse or su supervisor, depending on what's happening in the situation so to see how we can go about it? So use all your resources. Don't be a lone wolf. That's the whole point of what we're discussing in this episode as a high quality nurse is don't be independent, ask questions, be, you know, and how to problem solve. And of course, with time as a newbie, you're going to get better. It's going to come easier as you know, disease processes. You can be a five, five star quality nurse like Peter Matt here. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. 
The ninth good quality of a nurse is being a patient advocate. You are directly working with the patient for your 12 hours. You know best what the patient wants, what the patient needs, what he's looking for. It's your responsibility to, to ask the patient questions, stand up for him when he needs to be stood up for. You're, you're almost, not necessarily in charge of the care, but you're the person that's, that's closest to the care. If there's a procedure coming along, make sure to always ask the patient, hey, do you know what procedure you have tomorrow? Do you have any questions? Because a lot of times the physician is going to go in, tell them what's going on, explain how it's going to be done, what to expect, and a physician leaves, and the patient was, was going to ask questions, but he just forgot, or he thought he knew everything, and then two hours later, the patient forgets what the hell is going on, why they're doing this procedure, what's going to happen, and then they start to kind of freak out a little bit. You always want to make sure that, that firstly, the patient knows what's going, what's going on throughout the shift for the procedure, because if they don't know what's going on, they're always going to, they're always going to be scared and they're always going to feel like they don't know what's happening next, what's going to happen tomorrow, what's going to happen in an hour. You have to be able to explain to them what's going on, what you're doing at all times, just so they feel comfortable and, and confident in your care. You have to be able to, to provide that. And then if they have any issues, problems, maybe they have a change of mind, you have to advocate for that. Because yeah, I understand the patient is on the procedure list for, for tomorrow for a central line going to, to IR, but now he doesn't want it anymore or he's trying to get more information or it wasn't explained properly. It's your job to now tell the charge or tell the physician, hey, patient so-and-so is having, having a change of mind. He wants some more information. Can you come explain to him? And you're going to get that pushback where, oh, I was already there. I explained to him. He needs this. It's like, I understand, but this is, this is what he's asking from you. And maybe you have to explain to him in a different, in a different way that he, that, that he needs this and how bad he needs it. But for right now, he doesn't think he needs it. He doesn't want it. And he's not sure what's going on. So that's how you have to kind of stand up and make sure that the patient is, is comfortable with what's being done. Yeah, a lot of good points you brought up, man. And I, this is one of the most important ones because we go into healthcare to advocate for patients and be there for them. I, I think it definitely happens a lot like before surgery where they're nervous, they don't know what's happening. Um, and even during rounding, sometimes a physician comes there, touches them, says a couple of things and they leave and they have no idea what the next steps are. What is my disease process? Because the physicians are so, uh, so busy. And mm -hmm. this reminds me, we did a contract one time in um, Palomar. This was after uh, Santa Monica. We did a contract over there, the nice uh, palace hospital. But anyways, mm -hmm. um, oh, I know now which one. And... Physician walks out, it's a cancer patient. They discuss code status. So the doctor from palliative was talking about code status. Mm. He walks out and the patient asks me, so what's full code and what's partial code? Mm. That's life Good and point. death, man. And if the physician didn't get through you with that and I have to explain it to you, which I have no problem because I'm advocating for you, but why is there such a missing communication when a doctor explains this best? Mm -hmm. So little things like that that you have to advocate for them. And this ad, uh, advocation sometimes might be from a patient family side too, where the family is almost like an overburden, tiring out the, the patient. And the patient feels guilty in a sense where they don't want them to stop or leave, but you see the distress in your patient's vital signs, maybe they're feeling their temper, their body language. Can you step in and advocate for your patient and be like, hey, I think you need some rest. It's best if you guys go home after 9 p.m. or some small little situations. But again, at the end of the day, it's just advocating for the patient. So be assertive, be proactive, and just know that patients have needs, their rights, and let them know that you're there for them. Don't let them feel like they're guilty and they can't do anything. So always empower them at the end of the day, just like we're empowering nurses in the profession so we could stand up for ourselves and do great things. You want to empower your patients so they have the right to say no or they have the right to speak up on their needs and not feel like they're a burden to the healthcare professionals. Because so many times we had patients and they say, well, I don't want to ask because you guys are doing so much and working so much. Well, I'm here for you. Just let me know and speak up. And that all starts from creating a safe space for the patient to express that and being able to advocate. Yeah, 100%. And tackling the whole family dynamics, that's a whole different episode Episode <laughs> in giant power nursing that you don't really get to know or learn about until you actually become a nurse because in school, they don't really teach you about 
anything that how to deal with family to maybe teach you about like family dynamics but that's about it Russ is you're gonna learn on a job 100 percent so yeah, guys these are the nine qualities of a good nurse to be that nurse to be I feel like respected in the healthcare profession where you won't be a lone wolf people reach out to you. you're gonna be a great advocate patients will love you your culture your nurses your doctors will love you and I think if you could hone in on these these nine qualities or see where you lack where you can improve it'll make you an overall a better healthcare professional yeah, good luck guys see you next week peace